All right. So um, I want to talk about the, um, the journey that I have had bringing uh, human-centered design to the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. Um, I joined the lab uh, in 2012 and uh, came at the opportunity to bring human-centered design into how we th think about and design the tools to command spacecraft. And so um, I thought there's a lot that I could share, but I wanted to walk folks through one particular journey. Um, so uh, I don't know how many folks know uh, about the missions that have been happening, but I think one of the most exciting things that's happening right now uh, is uh, NASA has just put a rover on Mars. Uh, it was actually uh, built uh, and designed at the Jet Propulsion Lab where I work. And it's really one of the first missions in uh, probably 20 or 30 years where astrobiology in other words, the understanding and looking for evidence of the origin of life in other locations in the universe uh, is one of the core objectives. And in fact, the rover uh, is going to be gathering, uh, drilling and gathering samples uh, on the surface of Mars for, and I think this is the most very, very exciting part, for the eventual return to Earth. Uh, there's a, a whole how that happens is maybe something we can talk afterwards. Uh, it's quite an exciting and complicated endeavor. But because uh, this is really the core objective of the mission, um, everything that we work on in order to figure out what the, how to operate the spacecraft and what science to conduct are really guided towards seeing if we can uh, effectively discover evidence of life on another planet. And to me, the idea that design can play some kind of role in that is kind of amazing. Um, so why don't we talk through how, I, how this came about. So this particular mission is landing at a location in Mars, uh, on Mars called Jezero Crater. And Jezero, as far as the scientists can tell, is the ancient remains of a delta. So they're imagining that, uh, that water, uh, standing water existed here long enough for bacteria to potentially have lived within it and for those bacteria to have left some kind of remains. And the spacecraft is, is going to look for these evidence of, of potentially for, of foreign life. Now, one of the things I wanted to explain is Given this particular geology, um, there were some incredible consequences for having a spacecraft trying to go and guarantee that it exists in the extremes of cold and radiation on the surface of another planet for long enough to get enough samples. And so I'll, I'll talk through some of the differences between, so MSL is Mars Science Laboratory. That's the previous rover. And that was the first project that I worked on at the lab and Mars 2020. So one of the big differences is that the, um, if you look at the entire mission life cycle of MSL, they were imagining that it was expected to drive about on the order of 10 kilometers. And um, during that time, it was gonna have about 90 days to do that. Well, if you look at, there's actually, the number of uh, the distance that they understand that the current rover Perseverance is going to have to drive is actually considerably, considerably farther in order to encounter enough diversity of terrain to make a determination that they've looked at enough potential candidate uh, locations for life. So this distance actually has pretty profound consequences on how you operate the rover. So let me introduce you guys to uh, just a couple of simple concepts. Ron, this is just what we were talking about. Uh, so right, we call the one spin around the Earth a day. So we use the term a sol for that on Mars. And there's a slight difference in the time that uh, Mars, uh, uh, between a day and a sol on Mars. And in fact, it's about 20 to 40 minutes difference. And what that means is, when we operate the spacecraft, uh, there's some actually pretty unusual consequences. So what happens is the operations team 
for curiosity. Let's focus on curiosity first on the left side of the screen here. So what you can see here is it actually, it takes 10 hours to command the spacecraft on any given day. And so if you look at what's kind of generously uh, what you'd call the work day on Earth, right? Those 10 hours are going to shift a little bit every day. And so when the 10 hours fall within the work time on Earth, uh, we're able to command the science on every day in what we call nominal salt. But something happens when the time starts to shift outside of the regular uh, bounds of, of Earth time. So in the beginning of the mission, the, the science team actually go on Mars time, which means they go to sleep uh, at what is effectively Mars night and wake up you know, in the Mars morning. But as you can imagine, that has a real, that's real consequences on your family and the rest of your, of your loved ones. And well, I mean, even, even if you want to play and, and pick up, you know, hockey league, you're not going to be able to do that if you're working from 8 p.m. to midnight or something like that. And so uh, they, what they end up doing is they have this, salt, this, this type of operations called restricted salt. And what they end up doing is they'll pick a, a, a reasonable but late time period and command the rover, and they'll send basically a day's command and then take a day off. So because the 10-hour window just does not align well with the Earth time, you end up having about as many restricted solves where we send no commands to the spacecraft as you do regular solves. And it turns out that that's really a strong limit on how, how far we can get the rover to drive. And so if you look at the concept of operations for Mars 2020, what the great leap that they realized is if we can make operations five hours long, then we'll be able to have many more nominal solves as opposed to restricted solves. And that's the critical insight for how we're gonna allow the rover to drive that much further. But now imagine you're the team that designs uh, operation software and you're at NASA and they say, you know, for as long as we've had rovers on Mars, it's taken 10 hours. And now we wanna take five hours. That's a, what you really want to call a radical change. In other words, NASA was not at all sure how they were going to do that. And uh, in fact, it, it was a, one of the more difficult questions people were really engaging with when I joined. Now, imagine you're a designer and someone says, I've got this really hard problem. We've got this thing. We know how to do it one way. We got to change how we're going to do it. We have to totally change how we're going to do it what do you recommend as a designer? So go into your design toolbox and think through how you might work out such a problem. And this is one of the ways in which uh, I think design made the strongest contribution to this mission. And you'll see it, it actually took many years to get from uh, what I'll talk about to actually delivering the work. But of course, I think what, what we decided to do oh, uh, is, so what we thought we'd do is, uh, propose, you know, hey, if you guys don't know if this is going to work, maybe the answer is prototyping. And um, I got to say, I didn't think that was going to be as radical a concept as it, as it was received. Let me give you a little bit of background just about mission operations. And just so I think you can contextualize some of the why people saw this as literally math. So first of all, um, Mars operations uh, every day on Earth currently includes 200 people. And so what you see here is one of the rooms uh, in the back here is another room uh, that's an equal size. And, and you'll see there's probably not 200 people here. And in fact, uh, these people are distributed in similar operation centers uh, all across the world. Um, and so you have teams in France and Australia and in Germany and Denmark um, really working on each of the different instruments. And uh, within the, uh, you know, the, this entire ecosystem, you have, uh, you know, depending on how you count, roughly 75 different applications. So when you talk about prototyping and you imagine, well, I'm going to I'm going to put something down on paper 
And uh, what I'm going to do is, you know, have one one designer and one user. Um, I think this was an amazing opportunity to kind of reflect what prototyping means and how we understand it. And so I think the way I like to describe what we were trying to do as prototyping mission operations is a kind of prototyping at a scale that I really don't think I've seen prototyping done at. And I'd love to have a conversation with you folks if you're familiar with a, a more of, of, of how prototyping has been used at scale. This is work that we're hoping to get published at, at CHI this year. So it's also fun to talk through work that we haven't really shared a whole lot yet. But the idea is that prototyping at scale gives us a chance to test with hundreds of people, tens of applications in tens of locations, an entire product process ecosystem. So it makes a little more sense when I said, let's prototype this, and people said, that's crazy talk. Um, yet I was not to be deter deferred. And so let me give you a little bit more background for kind of how prototyping evolves at NASA and talk about how we came about this process. So there's, it's interesting. One of the things I think I learned in trying to work in an organization that works in aerospace as opposed to software, but that even prototyping turned out to be actually a very a, a term of art in hardware design, where it meant a specific, smaller scale, but still entirely functional version of, uh, of a piece of hardware. So in fact, even saying prototyping literally didn't make sense to people. So we had to learn how to evolve the language. And in fact, the language that I learned that was a, a match with the aerospace domain was what you might call simulation. And simulation has existed in aerospace for some time. And in fact, you can see here uh, this smaller scale uh, airplane in a wind tunnel, right? So this is a simulation in that it's not a functional airplane, right? That would be a prototype. And so you can see this is, they've had physical simulations and of course, computational simulations. And so uh, this, these are the techniques that we're familiar with, with the folks at NASA. And if you go back into the kind of the, the black and white photography of the Apollo era of NASA, they actually had simulations that were quite elaborate and complicated, but still for particular individuals. Here's one of the astronauts training with the lunar module in the docking simulator. And so you can see here, like an elaborate machinery was built for just a singular tau. So it's not as though there is not precedent, but I think what was especially interesting about the mission operations context was when you read the concepts that the, uh, basically the systems engineers came up with, I have this uh, image of, art of, uh, of uh, acrobats here, because it seems as though handoffs are made entirely perfect. In other words, the kind of the way humans interact seems as though it's of an uh, entirely artful way that I don't think represents the reality of how people behave, even in a tightly orchestrated context of mission operations. And so I, I kind of use this image uh, of uh, crowd surfing in that I actually think even in more scripted phenomena, uh, actually a uh, the way decisions um, uh, are, are brought about is often as emergent as it is scripted. And so what I thought was so beautifully complex about simulating operations is that we, we uh, because we're not trying to just draw a whiteboard out for how the ideal version is, if we can effectively walk people through it, what we're going to do is observe the places where these emergent phenomena uh, are in fact being enacted and assess the efficacy of a design in a way that you would not be able to if you are simply going by your drawing. So we came up with a concept that we like to call a design simulation. And I included the language here in the label because this is exactly how you have to communicate something to NASA. So a design simulation allows us to explore the technology and the human technical subsystem, right? That's how, that's how NASA would describe what we might call the emergent socio-technical properties, right? So you're imagining that there's a complex interaction between people and technology, often people and other people mediated by lots of technical systems. 
So let's describe what the design system is. So as we described it to the people that we were trying to pitch as part of the mission, uh, we imagined it as a kind of role-playing exercise that we focus, we would start by focusing on a subset of the entire operations process and allow us to look particularly at the highest risk elements. And the idea here was that we'd be able to, at any given time, in a way that might not have been a really feasible or easy to do with just drawing, see who's in the room and what their various roles are. And then, of course, see how and when they decide to work together and how they do or don't make uh, decisions. Um, some of the most important things that you would get people to, to say in real time is like, hey, I'm not comfortable uh, committing the spacecraft to do that. I don't have enough information. That's not really in the process model that the uh, operations teams come up with. So we really need to see these things. Uh, of course, we want to see which tools are used and when and to do what. And of course, you want to see when people also want to put their headphones on and say, I'm by myself, I'm not listening to anybody. Uh, what work requires quiet time? And that's also a really important thing to learn. So let's walk through the kinds of things that you need to do if you're going to prototype something at this kind of scale. And I think we're going to learn along the way how much it feels like even prototyping at the smaller scale and what are the kinds of things you can learn and not learn. So I think one of the first things you have to see if you're going to prototype something this complicated is, is where does the data come from and how realistic does it have to be? And so we took this approach of imagining that data could be a mix of fidelity in that you can see here a designer is drawing a, a flag which would represent a scientific point of interest on what is definitely not a real image of the Martian surface. But there are some roles for which this simulated data are not nearly specific enough. And in fact, some of the things about the traversability of the rover or understanding what the, whether a scientist might be interested in uh, doing a, a, a particular study of a rock. And for those kinds of things, we needed to get high fidelity data. So here is our prototype rover. As you can see, it's radically simplified. Uh, in fact, what you see in the middle, these are uh, examples of the engineering cameras and the perspective uh, from the rover. From, so if you look at the images, what you're able to see are the front wheels, just as though you could see in the actual rover. And so, um, so we would go out and get high fidelity data. Um, and you can see this is in the JPL Mars yard. So it's a part of JPL where we actually have uh, terrain where all the rocks and the sand are uh, colored and the rocks are the shapes of rock. So we went out and we got really high fidelity data and we brought it through our, the computer models. And then what we have to do is we have to assemble uh, the, these mix of real data that we would print out on paper, uh, as well as these screens and assemble these views into simulated applications. And so what you can see here is uh, particular views from an individual application. And of course, just exactly like paper prototyping, you need to be able to capture the different states that the application is going to be in and come up with some representation schema that's easy for you to trade the state. And so you'll put maybe the contents of one particular panel on one sticky note, right? So all that feels the same. But I think what, how it starts to feel a little bit bigger is you can see here that we actually need entire walls of whiteboard because each one represents just the panels on one application. And so it starts to grow in complexity. And so at first we thought, right, let's use this entire wall of whiteboards to create uh, applications. And let's, let's try it not quite at 200 people. Let's, let's make sure that we're gonna get it right first. Let's focus on maybe some of the higher risk areas and some of the things with, with not all of the staff and not all of the applications. And so in these examples, these are two users who are actually walking through. And so they're users of a particular type called, who go by the role rover planners. And so rover planners are the, the individuals in operations who have the incredibly exciting and difficult job of maintaining the safety for the robot mobility. 
So anytime the robot's going to drive somewhere or the arm's going to touch something, their job's to simulate it. And so here they are going through. And so this was always going to be one of the hardest questions for how we would maintain safety during such high mobility. So we thought, let's start with one of the highest, uh, most unknown areas. And um, should I just maybe time check? I'm almost at, at 20 minutes here. I'll, I'll speed up for a little bit. Uh, so anyway, we would walk through these use cases with on the scale of 20 users at a time and on the scale of four to seven confederates. And so you can see here, here are uh, members of the design team. Uh, the rest of the folks are different folks of the mission operations team. Uh, and you can see here are our actual printout image data. Here are our printout UI data. Now, as you can see, when we wanted to start to scale it larger, we made our own storyboards that walked through all the different stages of how each of the different meetings would go and each of the different individuals would, uh, would, would need to connect all throughout the scale of the day. And then we were ready for our pitch. Of course, we, we asked the Mars 2020 project office to support this. And to our delight, given the success of the work, they green lighted it. And just to give you a sense of the scale here, in order to prototype operations, uh, we needed. We brought the entire Mars 2020 science team to JPL. Oh, sorry, I'm I'm running ahead. Of course, we had to figure out how to do new events like data. When new data would come down, uh, we basically had to bring in uh, these envelopes that we would secretly hand off to different people that they can look out for the downlink. Um, ah, and so here, it took uh, about a year to prepare every screen of every application for the 200 people. And what you can see here is uh, just one of the meetings <laughs> that the group was going through. This is the science team. And I'll just, uh, in over three days, we worked on uh, 20, so not the entire 75 of the applications, and we needed 30 confederates to disperse and update the screens. And I'll just show you uh, some of the data down here. If you focus, for example, down here, you can see people are actually looking at computers, but here are also the multiple screens that we have them looking at. Uh, and I'll show you another example. So if we'll just blow this up. So we've got this really combination of fidelity of UI, fidelity of data, and, um, and, and multiple applications. So we're, we're just crossing all kinds of boundaries. Uh, so I'll, we'll look at this particular area here, just another one of these examples where we've got multiple levels of fidelity, uh, multiple computing, so multiple types of application that people are working on. Um, so what did we learn? I think, you know, the first question that Mars 2020 had was like, hey, is it going to work at all? And I think the most exciting thing that we identified is, you know what, it's actually not crazy. We think it could work. So that was one of the best things we're able to get. You can actually confirm uh, or, or assess a design holistically. But of course, one of the even more exciting things is you get to observe the gaps. And these are the things that we get to tell the mission. Uh, we found it today, aren't you happy? And of course, nobody's ever happy to hear about the holes in the design, but it's much better to hear about three years before launch uh, than actually when you're in the middle of mission operations. And so I'll uh, show this box in the back. If we uh, zoom in on it, here are scientists uh, actually um, creating an application of their own that captures some very important details that were not captured by any of the other new applications that we prototyped. And it's something that we call science intent. And the idea behind it is that um, basically beforehand, when the missions were 10, excuse me, when the operations were 10 hours, you had the scientists planning the, uh, all of the, op the observations and then handing over to the engineering team who could then figure out how to implement those, those observations as code. So the engineers were in the room to understand what it meant to do a particular set of observations. But in order to get the, the actual operations down to five hours, the team made a determination that they'd run them in parallel. So what you actually have is the day before the science team comes up with a conversation, and then they just write down uh, what the experiments are, and they hand it off to the engineering team who will implement the next day. So what we 
we achieved faster operation, but what we also got in the way of was the beautiful nuance that gets communicated when a scientist explains why they want an observation. In other words, we captured the what and not the why. And so uh, what we realized is we needed an application to allow scientists to explain why, uh, and we needed it to be less complicated than a paper, which is how scientists often communicate the why. And so we've got a way to structure scientific knowledge uh, it, that could be usable by the engineering team that we call the science intent application. And this is one of, I think, the great moments of success for design in mission operations because we literally found a gap and, and determined a way to address it. And this is an application that we, the, the mission agreed to fund, and they are now literally using an operation uh, every single day. And it's just been great to get to see that uh, happening. So uh, I'm a little, uh, I'm going a little over, so I just wanted to make sure one thing was clear in that while I'm expressing things uh, of, that they represent uh, the total work of a wonderfully committed and diverse group of designers that come from a really wide uh, set of backgrounds. And I think this is one of the essential things that makes the group that I've been able to grow at JPL so interesting because I think they, they bring such a diversity of perspective to solving so many of the problems. And of course, while I'm super excited about what I shared here today, it's really just a single example. I'll jump across these. I had some other examples uh, in here. Uh, maybe I'll just end it there. I, I've, there's lots of other work that, we could, that, that the group does and that we, I'd be also happy to, to talk through. Um, but I just wanted to focus on this one today because design was such a high visibility, disruptive way for us to approach uh, a problem that I think has otherwise not been approached with a design thinking methodology. So I hope what's, what comes across is that human-centered design uh, as a strategically valuable discipline at a place like NASA feels like something that's somewhat improbable when I started it and was certainly looked like with incredulity. But I also think that through the determination and flexibility and creativity of the folks in my group, we've been able to demonstrate that it's not just valuable, but essential. And I hope everybody takes that away as something that you can bring to whatever crazy idea you're thinking about applying design to. And I think that's where we're gonna get the most interesting engagement of design uh, across a range of disciplines where people say, no way, it can't possibly work. Show them that it can. All right, Scott, that's absolutely amazing. And, and actually, I mean, I'm sure there's lots of discussion, but I'm just wondering, maybe you could take like one, like a couple of seconds, just quickly, like just slide by slide if there were the other projects that you wanted to, um, sure. uh, just, just so people get an understanding of the range. Okay, well, one of the other ones that I think I'm also especially proud of is uh, basically the visualization tools to analyze the data that will come back to make an assessment of alien biosignature. And this is uh, by partnering with one of the instruments on the arm of the Mars 2020 rover. And that's this, uh, what's called Pixel here. It's Planetary Instrument for X-ray Lithochemistry. And it's an X-ray spectrometer that uh, will basically uh, be able to assess the, um, the structure of fossils. Well, basically any kind of mineral. And uh, myself and my team uh, similarly partnered with the, the team of astrobiologists. And we actually convinced them, hey, you know, if we're designers, we could teach you something about astrobiology that maybe you don't know about your own work practice. And again, it's the kind of thing that kind of seems incredulous to that group of scientists. And here is an example of the application that we've delivered to the Mars 2020 team uh, that allows a, a team to uh, basically identify different types of mineral classifications using their spectra and to be able to uh, assess correlations. Uh, additionally, the team works on uh, earth science, uh, assessing and making sure that data are available uh, to the public. We have a whole series of work where we've, let me see if there's other things. 
to be found in here. Uh, we've gotten to uh, effectively conduct experiments on the use of virtual reality to, uh, to be able to assess the geology of another planet that someone might not ever be able to visit. Uh, I think I might have cut the others out just to make this presentation more manageable. Uh, but I could send some links to a larger portfolio of the work. But there's a broad range of work that, uh, that uh, we, we get to focus on. Largely, it's around uh, effectively operations of spacecraft, assessing the data that are often of a geophysical nature. And so there are physics, uh, chemistry, biology, um, uh, Earth, atmosphere, um, earthquake. I mean, all, basically all the physical sciences. Um, and of course, biology around the, the, the evolution of life and whether it uh, arrived, uh, evolved elsewhere. Okay, fantastic. So, so now we can, um, yeah. So this is um, amazing, um, and we can open it up. And I, I just, I think, I just want to say one thing that um, um, it's a great presentation. I was just thinking, like for everybody, that on one hand, as you said, it's kind of like incredulous, like wow. I mean, you know, design at NASA, JPL, um, and so seeming in some sense so remote and hard to wrap your head around. On the other hand, you know, your presentation touched on things that we are dealing with in this class, storyboarding, participatory workshops, working yeah. with all your stakeholders, actually pushing your stakeholders, which is what I saw what you did, which was absolutely, and in ways that were surprising, but then, you know, like bringing the science and the engineer and the why with the what is just, is, is amazing through design. So and so, in many ways, this is actually completely relevant. To everything that 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 that, every, that we've been discussing and learning in the class. Um, so, and that's actually a wonderful experience because it's so out of context, it seems. But also, we're talking about stuff that is just, I mean, you know, levels of importance, but also everywhere, everyone can relate to this idea of everyone yeah. watching this probe. And anyway, so absolutely amazing, Scott. You're doing great work there. So, and it's just. Uh, um, 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 uh, fantastic to see. I was, you know, it was really nice to get this chance to uh, share some of the work with the students. So I really appreciate your giving me the opportunity. And I hope folks uh, feel empowered through the design that you can bring to the, to all of the challenges that you're interested to engage with. And that that's something that I hope, if the story I got to share today served any Served, served any good is, is that you you feel like crazy things are okay to try and um and and that i think design can can really provide some compelling um leverage to to really make progress on some very difficult problems so it's fun to share that that with you i know that's something i really care deeply about and uh, i hope i hope it, it helps everybody think about what they're interested in doing going forward. That's anyway, cool. I really appreciate the opportunity. So, Great, awesome words of empowerment. And I know transformation is a big thing with you. And so that's really, that came through, sure. that was fantastic. All right, Scott, thanks again. Thanks, sure. Scott. Take hey, care, bye-bye now. Yeah, cool. Oh, thank you, bye now.